of which identify with the LGBTQ community. And while we have our differences, so many are looking for answers that the world just doesn't have. And so may this be an opportunity for us to shine the love and truth of Jesus, even to the darkest corners of our community and nation. And now, Lord, as your servant, Pastor Jay, comes to open your word, please speak through him and to us and help us to respond with courage. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen, amen. Please give a warm Restoration Church welcome to Pastor Jay. That's very warm. <laughs> it, it's amazing how fast Pastor Ed speaks in the morning. Man, how do how do we how do we catch up with him? Wow. He expects us to be that awake. <laughs> Brother. Man, that's uh, faster than my uh, my Hispanic friends as they speak fast too. Uh, so I'm going to slow it down a little bit because I want you to appreciate the, the speed at which I speak. <laughs> uh, sometimes I crank it up and sometimes I dial it down. But today, in celebration of the week of Thanksgiving, I'm going to take you through some reminders because it is always good to remind each other about the Word of God and about our lives in relation to Him. And as we look into His Word this morning, we're going to ask the question, what does gratitude mean? And you guys already have an answer for that. I already know what the word means. <clears throat> and so do I. But we're going to let the Word of God define it for us and help us to understand with a little more clarity, what he is talking about when he, when he tells us to give thanks. So how many people do you really know who are gratitude people? People who are actually expressive and are oozing gratitude. Because the, the fastest cure for complaining, the fastest cure for pessimism, the fastest cure for any negative emotion is gratitude. Just try to put those two together and see which one wins if you focus on gratitude. When you see a person who is having a bad day, how do you try to console or encourage the person? Do you fill them with more pe pessimism or do you fill them with more optimism? And if you are optimistic, there's a reason for it. And the reason why optimis optimism exists is because of this. Our perspective has to change in order for our emotions to change on the inside. So here, what we have is a story of 10 lepers. And already we begin with this subject of pessimism because lepers are diseased. So if I say, here's a great, happy, healthy person, then, okay, we start with optimism. If I start with 10 lepers, not just one, but 10, then we are beginning with pessimism. And as we delve into this text, let's see what the lepers have to teach us along with what Jesus is teaching us. If you have your Bibles, please turn to chapter 17 of the book of Luke. The book of Luke has this story and it begins with verse 11, this setup. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And so every time we study the scriptures, please make note of details that they put in and they leave out. So they're on the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And they went, or, or and, and as they went, they were cleansed. 
One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. We have a very, very abbreviated account of what happened with Jesus and the ten lepers. And here we're supposed to gain from this an understanding of who Jesus is, what the lepers have experienced, and how we are to live in response to the understanding of this, of this account. So my question to you this morning is, do you enjoy life? Do you want to see God work in your life? Do you want to benefit from God's work in your life? Then I'm going to admonish you to do this according to the text. And that is, if you're in a dissatisfied place, if you are in a, needed, a needy place, do you have needs? Are you dissatisfied with the present condition of yourself? Apparently they were. They were diseased. To whom do you seek refuge and solutions and comfort? Apparently, by the modeling of these leopards, it was the Lord. So let me give you a sequence here. Ask, obey, and then respond by faith. So here it is. Ask and and. Obey God's command by faith is the admonition, the summary of this text that I will unpack for you. There were ten who saw Jesus, and they asked for pity, it says. They didn't ask for healing. Why? Why didn't they ask for healing instead of just pity? Have pity on us, have compassion on us, do something for us. Why? Because they thought they weren't deserving. They thought they weren't deserving of healing. And why did they not think that? Because in the Jewish mind, whatever is abnormal of you is a direct result of your sin. So the fact that they have leprosy In the Jewish mind, they assumed that it was something that they did. So if they if they did something that they uh, received the the leprosy for, then for them to ask for healing is asking for forgiveness. And God is not a God of forgiveness. He is a God of justice. So they didn't ask for healing because that means they were asking for forgiveness, and they can't ask for forgiveness. Imagine the heartache and the life that we would be living if we couldn't ask for forgiveness. It would be tragic. We offend each other daily. And if we can't ask for forgiveness, we are going to be miserable people. And imagine how miserable they felt when they had leprosy for life. Nobody got healed from leprosy. Let's see how we can relate to these individuals by reading this teeny little description. As he was, this is verse 12, as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy, met him. And it says this. They stood at a distance. They stood at a distance. To go back and remind you why they did that was because if they're diseased and they are infectious, 
you can't stay very close to other people for fear that you will infect them and then they will be fearful that they will be infected so they're going to keep their distance. Do you think social distance was new? It wasn't. They were mandatorily distanced from healthy people. They had to live by themselves in a quarantine colony. That's why there were 10 of them. They can fellowship with each other, but they couldn't fellowship with healthy people. The miserable present parallel of that is uncanny. The elderly who weren't allowed visitors, families who could not get together, kids and friends, young adults, whatever, could not join together for fear that they would get each other's diseases. And here they are. How did they come to this happenstance to meet Jesus? It says in verse 11, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Did he intentionally take that route for the purpose of meeting the ten lepers? We can only conclude that in, God, in God's sovereignty, these ten had to be ministered to, so Jesus had to take that route. No matter what situation we find ourselves, Jesus is going to make his way there. You may not notice it. I bet a lot of people didn't notice that it was Jesus walking by them. I mean, in their midst, they don't know who that is. Oh, well, he must be somebody special because he's got disciples, people following him. And it's really, it's a shame. Because I look out my window, or I look out my neighbor, neighborhood, and there's this going on. Here's the husband. Here's the wife, about 10 feet behind him. That culture, most likely Middle East and Indian, the husband and, and the wife, they don't walk together. The wife has to follow behind him because she is of lesser value than he is. She would never be bold enough to track and walk beside him because then that's frowned upon and she might even be physically assaulted for it. And here we notice that the lepers see Jesus, see the disciples, know who he is, called him by name. I don't know how they heard about Jesus, but apparently Jesus was famous to certain people. And here they were, they were famous to the lepers, people who didn't matter. And they're the ones who recognized Jesus and said, Master, have pity on us. We only have verse 14, Jesus responds. We don't have anything else. There are other texts where he interacts with, with a leper, but in this case, we only get one statement from Jesus. And we're supposed to learn as much about the situation from that one verse. So, if God packed all that information in one response, then we better learn. Let's ferret it out. Let's dig it out. It says, when he saw them, he said... Not when he heard them. Did Jesus hear them? Yes. I mean, they shouted. They were too far to use normal conversation to talk to Jesus so that he would hear. They had to raise their voice because if you're way back there, I'm not going to say, may I have some napkins? I say, hey, hey, brother Ed, may I have a napkin? I have to lift up my voice. I have to raise it. And so, of course, Jesus heard them, but it's not the hearing that he responded to, it says. Jesus didn't respond to these lepers because he heard them say, have pity. Yes, he heard them, but he says, when he saw them. So please 
Every detail is important. Always make note of the specifics of the context and what it says so that we will understand the situation better. Jesus specifically responded to what he saw. The skin, the nose, the cheeks, the expressions on their faces. And he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And notice, it is not singular. It is plural. Make note of every detail of the text. He saw them, and then he says, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed, was the response. So here is this truncated story from which we have to understand what is going on. Jesus didn't have a sit-down dialogue of how long did it, what, was this disease for you? When did you contract it? You know, how, how are the living conditions? Uh, do you need some food? Because we got bread here with us. None of those conversations. It was not a matter of sit down and have a compassionate conversation with the ten. Jesus just took care of their needs. And their primary need was a need to understand that they could be forgiven. Because he didn't take care of their physical needs. He didn't contribute to their desires for a better situation. He was confronting their whole psyche of there is no such thing as forgiveness for us. We need pity for our situation. He just tells them to go show yourselves to the priests. Ask and obey God's command by faith. So, what happens? <clears throat> they weren't about taking care of their spiritual need. They somehow understood that whatever he says goes. For them... Just because Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest, they left. They didn't get any, did they get any pity? Have mercy, pity, and compassion? Did they get any? No. Jesus didn't touch them just like he touched the other leopard in a different situation. Jesus just told them to go and show yourselves to the priest, and then they took off. That's a very, very strange response. For Jesus to say, go show yourselves to the priest, what was he saying? Well, the process that God specifically implemented for the purposes of healing or declaration of healing is, if you have an infectious disease, you have to go show yourself to the priest. And then he says, oh yeah, you have an infectious disease. Quarantine yourselves. If you have leprosy, which is permanent, then you're going to have to be quarantined for life. But it is the priest who declares that you have an infectious disease, and if you got healed from an, uh, another type of infectious, infectious disease that you could be healed from, then he would see that and declare you free from the infectious disease. He's the one who says that you have it. He's the one who says you no longer have it. It is only he who determines that. Nobody else can determine that because God has authorized the priests to do it. So when he says, go show yourselves to the priests, he was saying, by the time you get there, you're going to be healed. Why? Why go to the priests for them to declare you, yeah, you have leprosy. They already know that. Like, I have to go all the way to Jerusalem to, to have a priest declare me unclean? That's useless. Futile. 
So for Jesus to say, go show yourselves to the priest, he said, by the time you get there, they will have something to declare to you, and that is, you will be free from the disease. And they obeyed. It took faith for them to be obedient to Jesus, to go to the priests. So they're on their way. The conversation that they could have had was, Jesus, we have the disease. We know that. They're going to tell us we have the disease. So what's the useless point of going to the priests? In the meantime, as they go, everybody gets healed. They looked at their skin because, you know, I don't know why he told us to go. Maybe they were complaining the whole time. I don't know why he was telling us, but we're going anyway. I don't even know why we're going. Whoa. Whoa. This is my real skin. Look at your face. Yeah, and your face, and your face, your face. It's now normal. And everybody is all excited because it was turned on. And then one guy realized, boom, Jesus told us to do that. Now I understand why he told us to go to the priest. Because we were going to be healed along the way. And he goes, huh? And he jumps, darts, and goes, hey, where are you going? I'm going back to him because I need to tell him a few things. Why? He told us to go to the priests. Did he not? So we should be obeying him to go there. That could have been a really good argument. I'm being obedient to his command to go to the priests. No, but there's a priority here. I'll still go. But I need to go back because I know exactly what he did. So he runs. Nobody else runs after him. This amazing realization has the ratio of a tithe. One out of ten. So I don't know. Okay, so let's say there are 30 people here. One out of ten. Three people will respond like that. The rest of you, shame on you. Something amazing occurred in this man's head. And that was Jesus healed us. He had more than pity on us. I need to go back to the person who forgave me of my sin. And the reality of every passage of scripture, you have to see two things, and I want you to look for it every time. Two things. One is the requirement of faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God, says in Hebrews chapter 11. So anywhere in the scriptures, if it doesn't have faith in it, then it's not going to be valuable. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ and the word of God. You will see faith everywhere. So that's number one. Number two, grace. You'll see in Jesus' interaction and in all of Scripture, as a matter of fact, you'll see faith and you'll see grace. Even from the very beginning, Adam comes, you know, with all these animals in tow, <laughs> all these animals, and, and God says, name them all. And he names them. And, then it, and the conclusion was there was no suitable helper for him. There was no woman, no female kind of a man. So he puts him to sleep, brings the woman to him. And when he brings the woman to him, what is the element of faith in here? Having met once, having met for the first time, not talked to her, 
no interaction, no resume, just once, this is your wife. The faith is, okay, what you provided for me is good for me, I'll receive her. It required faith. Everywhere in scripture, faith is going to be required because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So when God challenges you on a daily basis to exercise faith, you know why, because then it's an opportunity to please him. So here, after the shock, <coughs> he went to Jesus to praise him verbally. Thank him verbally. Because the pronouncement that he is clean can wait. It is a priority to recognize the Lord's work first. It is appropriate for him to glorify God in his healing. He could have gone with the rest of them to get declared clean, go to the family, celebrate with the family, and forget all about the fact that Jesus healed them. How are they even going to find him after that anyway? But how were they going to find him even now? Well, we're given a little detail in the beginning. Apparently, it is significant, significant that it says he was on his way to Jerusalem. Why? Why is that little detail there? Because that's where the priests are. Why? Because that's where the temple is. And they hang out in the temple. That's where they are. So Jesus is going to Jerusalem. And then when he told the lepers to go show yourself to the priests, where are they going to go? <laughs> go to Jerusalem. So they're all going to Jerusalem. Jesus even made it easier for them to come back. Why? Because they're doing this, and then when they come here, they're going to meet even faster. It wasn't that Jesus was going the opposite direction, so they would go all the way over there, and they're trying to catch up because he's going the other way. No, they're going in the same direction. So when he came back, it was even a shorter distance because Jesus on his way to them. What is that? That's grace. My Lord is amazing. Your Lord, you call him Lord, is amazing. But look what they got right. Okay, look what they got. It says, the text specifically says <clears throat> Jesus master have pity on us if Jesus is your master if he tells you something should you not do it so Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Well, they just called him his, their master. So if he says, go show yourself to the priest, should they not go? Yes, they went. They treated him like they called him. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? That would be inconsistent with your title for me. But they got his name right, they got his title right, and they got their response right. They're teaching us a lot. Thank you, lepers. Thank you, Jesus. Let's look at this. <clears throat> when they met, it says they... in a loud voice in verse 13, said Jesus. Because they had to raise their voice when their, their distance. It wasn't just six feet. No, it's a lot further than that. It was worse. 
So anytime you hear a leper saying something to a person who was healthy, you know that he's going to have to raise his voice because he had to keep his distance. So it says, Jesus, Master. And then when the man came back, this is what it says. Verse 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. Well, we have to, we have to translate that word for you. Because loud here is actually mega. Where we get the word megaphone, mega millionaire. <laughs> I mean, he, he belted it out. It wasn't just for covering the distance. It was, this is beyond covering distance. This needs to be shouted from the rooftops. That's how he praised God. Whenever I go to churches, I get the privilege of worshiping with people. Never seen, sometimes, maybe familiar, I don't know. But one of the things that I do is I take a pulse of the congregation by the loudness of their singing. I say, hey, why aren't they singing? Where's the Lord? <laughs> Where's the Lord? I, I think they're more concerned about each other and, what, and about what people think than they are celebrating the Lord's goodness and who he is. Now, I don't want to guilt trip you into singing. Definitely not. What I want to do is I want to elevate the understanding that you can be free to worship God because he is his elevator. He finally understood that. He didn't care. Why is the guy shouting, praise the Lord, hallelujah? Because he's been liberated from his sin. Both spiritually and physically, he was healed. That is worth celebrating. We need to praise God every day because we understand that. If we don't, we need to ask God, do stuff in my life, Lord, so that I would know. And then instead of doing something, he shows you something. He reminds you of something, and that is, you know you've been cleansed from your sin for all eternity, right? Uh, I don't feel that way. Well, then let's tra track that down. Let's see where the stumbling block is. Why are you not liberated from your bondage to condemnation? Because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you still feel condemned, you're going to have to track the Lord in his word, with fellowship with each other, to understand that, yes, indeed, why am I holding this in? Why am I, I treating God like he's half done? He's not. Amen. <laughs> See? Like that. Out of the mouth of babes. Don't hesitate to praise the Lord with a mega voice in front of others. Who cares? You don't know what I know. Those Christians are crazy. You should see how they're jumping up and down. I mean, they're, they're nuts. Well, you don't know the Lord we, we know. Do you think that this was inappropriate? He was now freed from his life sentence. How is he not going to celebrate that? And how is he not going to give credit where credit is due? He needs to. And he does. And here's the indictment of the 90%. After, verse 16, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. That's the least he could do. And then it makes this note, and he was a Samaritan. Now, he was going, remember he was going between, here's, here's the line between, line between Samaria and, and uh, Judea. So if I'm over here, I'm a Jew. From over here, I'm a Samaritan. 
But look at the grace of God. This Samaritan and this Jew, they don't even talk to each other if they're all healthy. But they have to be sick to talk to each other and live in a community with one another and actually get along? That's nuts. Again, we learn something amazing from the lepers. Yeah, well, I'm Korean. Well, I'm Japanese. Well, we don't like you Japanese because you took over our country. We're in the same hospital. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, no, I'm doing nothing. No, 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 no. We're having fellowship. That's what they were doing. Samaritans and Jews having fellowship, walking together, calling out to Jesus together. And here is this Samaritan. Where are the Jews? Where are the Jews? Jesus implies that there were Jews among them. And a Samaritan is the one who is setting the example. That's really good news for all of us. Uh, I think most of us. Are there any Jews here? Jewish background? Great. Because we are Messianic Jews. Because this is highlighting a Gentile. Gentile did this. He says, nobody came back. There. All of them were cleansed, right? Did he know how many were cleansed? Yes. Did he intend for all of them to be cleansed? Yes. So he knew all of them were cleansed. But the Samaritans, he's the only one who came to thank and praise God. And if we represent the Gentiles, fantastic. He's highlighting that. And Jesus finishes with, after he said, we're not all ten cleansed, where are the nine? What an indictment. So where's, where's your gratitude? That's the question we can ask ourselves in one of the applications of this text. Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? That's a question. It's a rhetorical question. You know what the answer to that is? He knows. The Samaritan knew. The disciples knew. And here is the kicker. Here we go. Verse 19. Then he said to the Samaritan, Rise, go, your faith has healed you. Made you well. He said, Rise, go. You did that which was appropriate. You came to recognize the giver. Now, you can now live. You can now live. Live free. Live with gratitude. Live for the glory of God. Once you meet Jesus and he has an impact on you, and once he declares you free to live, you can then truly live. <laughs> There's nothing hindering you from living. There's nothing hindering you from living free of guilt, living free of anything that hinders you, decouples you, restricts you. You have now been liberated. You can be all that I've created you to be. Enjoy life. Because I have given you a second chance. Rise and go. Your faith made you well. Remember, faith is always rewarded. How do we know that? The very first time faith is highlighted was, of course, in the life of Abraham. And the quote that is, that is constant in the New Testament about his faith is, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, you can't, we can't live a righteous life. But if we trust God, then that is counted as righteousness. And that is the beginning of our relationship with him. There is no other way to 
have a relationship with him until we exercise faith, until we trust him. The first time Abraham trusted God was when he said, go, leave your house, family, everybody, just take your wife and kids and go. No kids at the time. But a, 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 a nephew who wanted to go, Lot wanted to go. But they leave their, their family, their culture, their land, and they go to a place that God hadn't even told them where to go yet. So that was faith on the part of Abraham. And it continues to the point where God says, okay, the, the promised child, the miracle child, the son that you have, sacrifice him to me. And I would love to do uh, an extended study on that. Because if your mind isn't blown, when we unpack that story, you will not understand the rest of Scripture. And it was credited to him as righteousness, and God told him to sacrifice his son, and he tried to go do it. That's faith. So it was credited to him as righteousness. Anytime we exercise faith, he rewards it. And he affirmed it verbally. The nine did not get that affirmation because they didn't come back for it. Okay, now for the definition. What is gratitude or thanksgiving? I'm going to give you what it is not, and I'll give you what it is, because you can figure out what it is by what it is not. All right, so here. Thanksgiving is not expressing appreciation for an act done in response to a command. Okay? Thanksgiving is not... Expressing appreciation for an act done in response to a command. Now that sounds, you know, ethereal. So the example is here, when the master commands a slave to do something, and he goes and does it, what is the slave doing? He's obeying, but the master doesn't thank him for it. So let me give you the text. The text before our text this morning in verses 11 through 17 is verse 7 to 10. And I'm going to read it for you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant, when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? Would he not rather say, in other words, that would not be normal. Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. He says, it would be inappropriate for the master to thank the servant for doing what he told him to do. So the master is not going to say, hey, thank you for obeying me. Just inappropriate. God is not going to thank you for obeying him. In other words, so why were these servants unworthy, though? So because we have to track this down. <clears throat> why were these servants unworthy, according to the illustration? Why would the servants call themselves unworthy? This word, akrios, is only used twice in the New Testament but it's really, really easy to define. Because the other place besides this, this, word, uh, this context, the word is used in Matthew 25, verse 30, where it talks about the man who hid his talents, buried it. And the master came back for accountability, and he goes, oh, you know, I hid it because all oh, these excuses. And he said, here, you can have your money back. And he said, you worthless that would be the word, because it is. I mean, it was worthless. What are you doing? I could have at least had interest. And remember from my previous message, I know, you won't remember. I'm going to remind you. A talent is not a little bit. 
A talent is 75 pounds of precious metal. If you had 75 pounds of silver or 75 pounds of gold, still you're rich. So that was a lot. And he was not faithful. So he is worthless. So the better definition is useless or worthless. But in Luke 17.10, if we're going to define them as or describe them as useless or worthless, it had to apply because they were slaves, not just servants. Why is that? Because if they were servants, they were hired hands, then they would be useful. Correct? I mean, they're serving on the table and they're getting the meal and taking care of the sheep and plowing. That's useful. It's not worthless. So it had to refer to their previous way of life. How did they become slaves in the first place? They were sold as slaves because they were useless to somebody. Or they were in debt. Still concluding and justifying the fact that we would call them useless. So they said, we are just unworthy. Both applying to the same person, but in a separate way. Okay, total, overarching, unworthy. So here they are unworthy. but reiterating the fact that the masters don't thank their slaves for being obedient. Then what is thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is, and this is the nuance that I'm going to add to our definition because it is applicable. Thanksgiving is the appreciation expressed to the one who commanded us and we benefited from the obedience. See the Nuance difference now in terms of just thanksgiving. It's not I hand you something that was beneficial to you. And you, yes, that applies. We are grateful when people give us gifts and all that. But here in Jesus' definition, according to this account, is that it was in response to a command that he obeyed or these people obeyed. And it benefited them because they obeyed. And that is the appreciation that they expressed. Well, only one did. All all of the rest of them should have. In verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. What happened? He was obedient And he received the blessing because of the obedience. And in response, he is thanking the person who commanded him so that he could be blessed. That is the definition of thanksgiving according to this text. And all of life. All of life. So, here, let's look at this. You've already heard the text. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And we're going, be joyful always, uh, challenge. Pray continually, uh, challenge. Give thanks in all circumstances, no way. That's the challenge of challenges. (laughs) What do you mean give thanks in all circumstances? This is nuts. Because I don't want to thank you for a broken arm. I don't want to thank you for cancer. I don't want to thank you for anything negative in my life. Can we be honest? Don't we we feel that way? I don't want to thank you for the death of my father when I was nine years old, only seven months here. 
I mean, I had to grow up without a father. How am I supposed to be a good father without having a father figure? And even then, he was a horrible example of a father. Beat my mother. Angry, drunk, violent, smoked, didn't take care of himself, died at the age of 39. How am I supposed to be thankful for that? So let's see. Let's go back to our definition. And the definition of thanksgiving is the appreciation expressed to the one who commanded us and we benefited from the obedience. So, in my context and in your context, are you being obedient to God? First question. Are you being obedient to God? Am I where I am because I'm being obedient to God? Am I speaking the way I'm speaking because I'm being obedient to God? Am I relating to people in the way that I should because I'm being obedient to God? Am I couched in the will of God? Am I in the center of it? If that is the case, if that is the case, anything that comes your way is from God, correct? If that is the case, no matter what you face, He brought it to you. And if He brings it to you, then you ought to be grateful for it. Then you go, how can I be grateful for something that is painful as this? Whatever we are dealing with. The answer is, how was Jesus able to take the cup and the wine and thank his father when it rep represents his own death? How? How is he picking up the bread and saying, thank you, God? How is he picking up the cup and saying, thank you, God? How is he doing that? Why? Because he's in the center of God's will, and he is the one who brought it to him. In all circumstances, absolutely possible. If we are being obedient to God, if we're not being obedient to God, all bets are off. Your gratitude can slip. But you will be full of gratitude because you have trusted in God and you are experiencing the things that you are experiencing because He brought it to you. Why? Let me give you a real simple illustration of this. Minor. I, I left my truck unlocked overnight apparently. Because when I <coughs> woke up the next day, things were missing in, in the back. Primarily, my set of golf clubs. What a pain. I said, they took, you know, where are my clubs? No, no more golf. I got to you know, pay for new clubs. What? And as I was struggling over that, I was asking, Lord, would you bring them back to me? Should I go to a pawn shop? You know, all of these things, I'm wrestling with the whole thing, right? I should go find it. Lord, you can perform a miracle and bring them back to me. I'm praying. Days go by. I should drive over to the pawn shop. Too lazy to do it. Should I call? Don't even call. Don't have the energy for it. And just discouraged. And so... In my discouragement, I'm praying, okay, Lord, you, could, you brought people's wallet back, you know, you brought people's cars back, you know, all of that stuff. My, my experience of other people getting their prayers answered when they lost something, there's a lot of them, but days go by, weeks go by, I don't have my clubs. So I'm asking, Lord, you can do everything. You can bring those clothes back. 
Me too. This was his answer. The value is in the loss. What value is there in losing my clubs? Then I understood. Sometimes you have to lose it in order to really understand. I mean, really understand that there are consequences you can't undo. So here, when people go to hell, it can't, it can't be undone. All of a sudden, we have to care a lot more than what we cared for. Because it's permanent. And if it wasn't permanent, how will we know the value of the beautiful feet that bears good news? How are we supposed to know that death is final here on earth? So don't have any regrets. Go see your grandma frequently. So you won't have any regrets. Because if you don't, you may. You may have regrets because it's permanent. And I thought, I will learn more from the absence of my clubs than having them back. Ah, now I'm grateful that those clubs are gone. Because now this lesson sticks even better. And now I am grateful to the Lord that he dispensed them. Gratitude solves everything, but this is what it says. It says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is thirdly mentioned. The first one was be joyful always. Second is pray continually. So let's put this in context. It says, all of these things and ended with in Christ Jesus. You in Christ Jesus. In other words, all believers should do this. Why? Because non-believers can't. Okay? So the fact that this command is given to us is encouraging. Why? Because it's telling you you're believers. If you are believers, then you can do this. If you're not, you can't. Can a believer be joyful always? No. Do you know why? 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 I mean, it's not, not okay. They can synthetically produce it. They can encourage themselves, you know, and they can say, I'm a positive thinker. And they could do that. Yes, they can. But they can't do what this command actually tells us. And that is the first time joy or rejoicing is mentioned is in the context. Jesus says this, don't freak out about the amazing reality of your power over demons, Jesus says. No, because when they were coming back from their little little excursion of, of ministry, they came back and said, man, even the devils have obey us. Man. And then Jesus says, no, uh -uh. that's not why you rejoice. No, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. That's even better. Right there. Can we rejoice always? Yes, why? Because our names are written in heaven. Non-Christians their names are not written in heaven. They can't rejoice always. Second, pray continually, it says. Pray continually. You can't pray continually without the Holy Spirit. So you have to have the Holy Spirit to pray continually, but if you don't have it, you can't. Therefore, non-Christians can't pray continually. Second. And then the third thing is, Give thanks in all circumstances. Well, how can they give thanks in all circumstances when they're not even being obedient to God? They're not even in the center of God's will. They can't do it. So this is all for us, and we celebrate the reality that we can do all of that because God is our God. Now, you have a wonderful,
wonderful Thanksgiving week. You have a wonderful Thanksgiving day. Rejoice with one another and sing. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for defining for us what Thanksgiving is. And without you, there is no Thanksgiving. To whom do we thank? Oh, but we can rejoice together. We can be the ten celebrating the reality, a new ten, without the tithing of one person. All of us can celebrate the fact that we are in you, you are in us. And we are being obedient and experiencing your grace on a daily basis. And for all things that come our way, we know that you sent them. And therefore, we thank you for it. And we rejoice and we celebrate the reality that we could all do it together. And we can all be grateful to you, both corporately and individually. For your glory and honor, we pray.